Well, the title we've got before us, if it wasn't for the Bible, would almost be laughable. That the governments of this world will be replaced by Jesus Christ. You see, there's not a government in the world, is there, that would consent to handing over their government to somebody else, let alone somebody else who is not even of their nation, let alone somebody else who will turn the ways of those nations upside down. In that reading we had read for us this evening, we have what will occur when the Lord Jesus Christ reigns. You see, in verse 3, we're told that many people will come and worship the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. They will go to Jerusalem from year to year, we're told elsewhere in Scripture, to worship Almighty God. So there will be one religion. In verse 4, he's going to judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. What we have here is the effect of the laws of Almighty God that the Lord Jesus Christ will send through, forth throughout the earth, taking effect. Not only will they manufacture instruments of agriculture out of their weapons of war, but they won't even learn war anymore. Tell that to the people of Syria and see what they think. It's something that is almost beyond belief if it wasn't for the scriptures we have before us. Verse 10 and 11 gives us a little hint of what is going to happen. We're told to enter that those will enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the great glory of his majesty. We're told that the lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So what are we being told? Well, the lofty looks of men, those who are in high places are going to be humbled. They'll be bowed down so that the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And it's repeated again in verse 17 that the lofty shall be bowed down and God alone will be exalted. You see, when God created the earth, he didn't create it to be as we see it today. He didn't create it to be something that man uses and, um, and works towards destruction of. You see, the simple thing is that if it's left to man, the earth that we're on will be destroyed. And the earth would soon be in a state where life can no longer be sustained. The environment, we know what's going on. Economically, militarily, we know what's going on. Eventually man will do something <coughs> that he regrets if God does not intervene. You see, many people look for peace, but it's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Peace will not come by man. Otherwise, those words of verse 4 that have been twisted and put outside the front of the United Nations building would come into effect. In Isaiah 45 and verse 18, we have the, the words of the prophet where he says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. You see, God tells us here that he created the earth for a purpose. He didn't create it to become a wasteland, to return to being without form and void. He didn't create it to be a land that's decimated by man, but rather, we're told, he created it. He formed it to be filled with his glory. He formed it to be inhabited. And, we say, and it's God who tells us this. God's purpose from the day of creation and before was for the earth to be filled with that which reflects his glory. 
and ultimately will include men and women who desire to give God glory and hence are a reflection of him. They reflect the ways of Almighty God in their lives. Numbers 14 verse 21, one of two irrevocable promises that God made at this time. He said, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. He was telling the nation of Israel, who he just told, would wander in the wilderness for a further 38 years, till all those who were over 20 years had died, that his purpose would be fulfilled. He will ultimately fulfil the earth with his glory. We know the other promise he made, or the other oath he made, that those people would die in the wilderness, came to pass. In Psalm 113 verse 3, we told from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Once again, it's the purpose God has with the earth, that from one end of the earth to the other, from the rising of the sun to the going down of it, his name will be praised. His name will be known among all people so that they can praise him, so that they can give him glory and honour. In those two passages there, we have the very reason why God will and has to intervene in this earth. Because man is not going to fill this earth with his glory of his own accord. And man is not going to see that God is praised from one end of the earth to the other. Rather, it will be quite the opposite. No ruler today has the desire to give glory to God, do they? Malcolm Turnbull, Donald Trump. Vlad Putin, Angela Merkel. They might claim to be religious, but the only religion they really care about is their own popularity, what they can get out of it. No politician, no political party today would have glory to God in the true sense as one of their governing principles. Yes, they might give words to such things, but they'll do their own thing, won't they? No politician today would get elected if he stood on the platform or on his platform, basing it on the things of Almighty God, because in the world today it is not popular. And what we see, what we can understand when we see that, is that God will intervene in the earth. He will intervene through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to see that these things come to pass. To see that his name, his glory, does fill the earth from one end of it to the other. In Luke 1, verse 31 to 33, we have the words of the angel who appeared to Mary. And he said, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. You see, at this time, when the angel Gabriel appeared unto Mary, he told her that the son that she would have would be the son of the highest, the son of God, and that the Lord God would give to him the throne of his father David. The throne of his great, great, great grandfather David. And that he would reign over that throne. Not only would he reign over it, but of that kingdom there shall be no end. There'll be no election. No military coup to remove him. Unlike the governments we see in the nations around us that come and go, this government will last forever. It will be a reign that will continue on and on. We're told that he will reign over this kingdom and it will be not be left or given to other men. I want you to remember that for a little later on. Because of that kingdom there shall be no end. Mary was told that her son would be given the throne of his father David. And these words take us back to the promise of da promises made to David in 2 Samuel 7. And verses 11 to 16, if you'll turn there, please. 2 Samuel 7, verses 11 to 16. 
The promise God made to David when he was told that he could not build a house or a temple for David, uh, for God, as he, had, as he desired. In verse 11 we read, And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for ever. <coughs> I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established for ever before thee. Thy throne shall be established for ever. It was a promise that was made to King David, as I said at the time when he was prevented from building the temple to replace the tabernacle as a house for God to dwell in. And David was told that God would make him a house. He would make him a house, and of that one would, that would come when he died. So the house that was spoken of here, we're told that it would be when David slept with his fathers. You see, David saw his son Solomon reigning. It was another son that he looked forward to. In verse 12, we're told that God would establish a kingdom. And this was to be a kingdom that God would establish with the throne on which Christ would rule. The kingdom the Lord Jesus Christ will inherit when he returns to this earth, which will shortly occur. Not only was David told this kingdom would be established, but he was told that he would see that kingdom with his own eyes before him forever. And while David died, he had faith that one day that would occur that God would raise him from the earth to see that throne established forever before thee, as verse 16 says. So David looked for that day when his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would ascend and reign over that throne as king. In Psalm 132 and verse 11, we're told that the Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it, of the fruit of thy body will I set up upon thy throne. So David once again was told here that it would be one of his descendants that would reign on that throne. It was to be one of his seed who would reign, the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ will inherit the throne of David for eternity. As Mary was told in Luke 1, Isaiah 9, verse 6 to 7. For unto us we read, a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. The prophet Isaiah tells us that of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. This government will be, one on, the th will be on the throne of David and from this throne will go forth judgment and justice throughout the earth. And it is, it's in fact this that will establish that throne forever. Because it won't be just judgment for the sake of judgment, like you have in Syria or Libya or any other country to one extent or another. This will be righteous judgment, judgment that is based on the ways of Almighty God. And we told once again that his throne will be established and of this government there will be no end. It will be a government 
that will grow in popularity. And ultimately it will grow to fill the entire earth. It will grow until all the world realises it is a true and righteous government that is God honouring and hence good for every person. And when that occurs, it will bring true peace to the entire earth. The kingdom will be established on judgment and justice that is righteous. And on this basis, it will increase, as we said, until it ultimately fills the entire earth. The prophet Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 23 and verse 5 to 8, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth which brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt. But the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. The prophet prophesies of one, of a time, when one will be raised up in the line of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, and shows he will be a king who will prosper and do judgment and justice on the earth. He is called the Lord our righteousness, and such will be the effect of his reign, that he will be seen as righteous. In this day we are told that he will be known as the one who brought Israel back from all countries, and he will reign over them as king. In verse 6 it says, In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. Israel doesn't really dwell safely today. Yes, they're confident in their own strength. But the headline I read today was, Israel celebrates 70 years, but is war with Iran going to happen? You see, all those nations around them are hostile to them. But we're told that in this day, Israel shall dwell safely. What an effect that will have on the earth. It won't be that the Lord liveth who brought up Israel out of Egypt as occurred under Moses, but rather the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I have driven them. So you name a country where there isn't a Jew today, where there isn't of the seed of Abraham, and we're told that they will go back and they shall dwell in their own land, the land of Israel the land of Lebanon, the land of Syria, the land of Jordan, and the Negev, which today is Egypt. That is the land that is being referred to here. You see, they will dwell in their own land, and they will dwell there safely. You see, he's called the Lord our righteousness. Can you name a righteous politician today? Self-righteous, maybe but not righteous in the ways of Almighty God. Despite the best of intentions, aren't they? What happens? They're elected. They come to power. They reign for a little while. And then the controversy starts. Some member does something. Some was a, a, a dual citizen and couldn't rule in the government anymore. We know what's happened in this country. But we're told that he shall reign and prosper so that his government shall increase. In Psalm 83, 89 and verse 35 to 37, we read, Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. God will not lie, and we're told here that he will not lie unto David, or that matter for, to anyone. He has stated to David that his seed would endure forever, 
And David's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is that one referred to. And of his throne, that will, it will endure like the sun. You see, there'll be no end of that. While the throne of David was removed because of Israel's wickedness and iniquity, when the Lord Jesus Christ re-establishes that kingdom, that will not occur again. Those people will turn to God like they have never before when they realise who it is they have turned their back on. This kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will last and be a faithful witness to God, both in the political and religious aspects of the kingdom. It will give glory to God to the total exclusion of all else. And for this reason, it will grow and fill the earth. In Daniel 2, we have a prophecy of what is termed in the latter days. The days that lead up to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of the days prior to the time when Christ will be given the throne of his father David. It's a vision of the latter days. The days we live in today. They are leading to this very day. And what occurred here is the king of, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. And he got his wise men and he said unto them, tell me the dream and then tell me the interpretation. Well, they couldn't do it. But there was one Daniel there who was a servant of Almighty God, who was able to tell the king that dream and also interpret it. And in Daniel 2 and verse 44, we're told, the king was told, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. What Daniel had just explained to the king was the progression of nations to the point where all those nations stood together and they were destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God replaced the kingdom of men. And we're told that this kingdom will not be left to other people. It will be unlike all ruling governments today where the ruler eventually dies. He's voted out. There's a coup whatever may occur, and it goes to somebody else. Of these governments, the governments we have today, there'll be nothing remaining, as they will be ground to be like the chaff which the wind will blow away, and there will be no place for them, as Daniel tells us. Sorry, that was, I missed a quote. Daniel 2, verse 35, and it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. Then shall the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold be broken to pieces together and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The Lord Jesus Christ and the government he will establish will grow and fill the entire earth to the exclusion of all else. Revelation 11 and verse 15 tells us this once again. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You see, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave to John, which he recorded so we could have this today, he tells us that the kingdoms of this world, he saw in vision the time when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. As Daniel the prophet stated, so it's stated here, these kingdom, the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, They'll not be left to other men, nor will it be a kingdom that will be destroyed, but it will last forever. It will grow and fill the entire earth until the earth is filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's many passages in scripture that tell us of the events that lead up to this, and we don't have time to go through all that. 
But what it shows is the Battle of Armageddon occurring and the Lord Jesus Christ intervening to establish this kingdom. Daniel 2, verse, sorry, Daniel 7 and verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Christ will be given a kingdom, a dominion and glory, a dominion that shall not pass away, and a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. It will last forever, for eternity. You see, all that does not give glory to God in that day will be done away. All that not, does not contribute to filling the earth with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea will be removed. And what we find is that at this time the earth will begin to reflect the glory of God as God originally had planned that it would occur when he created man on the earth. And at this time it will grow until the entire earth reflects the glory of Almighty God. If you'll turn with me please to 1st of Corinthians in chapter 15. We have here explained what will occur in this kingdom. The things that will happen as the Lord Jesus Christ reigns. Because you see we've said that this kingdom will not be left to other men but it will last forever in 1st of Corinthians 15 verse 24 to 28 we read then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the father when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death for he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is exempted, accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. Sorry, may be all in all. So this passage here starts with the end of what we'd say is the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ by telling the reader that he will deliver the kingdom to God, his Father. And this will occur when Christ has put down all rule and authority. When all has been subdued under the Lord Jesus Christ, then he will deliver the, king, the kingdom up to his Father. Hence the words of Daniel 2, verse 44, we looked at earlier. This kingdom shall never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. You see, Christ will deliver it up to his Father when all has been subdued, when all on this earth gives glory to God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul tells us, will reign until all enemies are put under his feet, until the day when all that does not give glory to God has been removed from this earth to the time when all is subdued unto God so that all uh, unto the Lord Jesus Christ so that all gives glory to God and once all this has been removed from the earth the last enemy of us all will be destroyed and that's death <coughs> when death is destroyed then this will truly be the case when the earth will can be will be filled with those who give glory to God to the exclusion of all else. In Isaiah 25, uh, 24, verse 21 to 23, we read, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth, and, he shall, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. You see, what we've been told here is what will occur when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth. 
We are told that he will punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high, the politicians and the kings of the earth that are on the earth. We are told that he shall gather them together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and, they sh and shall be shut up in the prison and after many days shall be visited. You see, no doubt there will be many politicians whose end will be death when Christ returns. But there will also be those who submit. We believe the Queen will be one of them or the ruler in uh, Britain will be one of them. And no doubt there will be other rulers. And we're told they'll be gathered together in a pit and shut up in prison for many days. And in verse 23 we're told that the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. You see, when they see the effect of righteous rule, how the Lord Jesus Christ rules on this earth, they will be ashamed. They will look at that and say, what a mess we made of things. Because they will then realise that they ruled according to the flesh, according to man, where this man rules according to the ways of Almighty God. <clears throat> Sorry, I've double printed my notes here in part. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> in Zechariah 14 verse 9, it's once again spoken. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. The result of the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ will be to bring true religion to the world. In that day there will be one Lord and his name one. You see, we have multitudes of religions today, don't we? We have every different form of it. But in that day, the Lord Jesus Christ will see that there is one Lord and his name one. And as a result of Christ reigning and the policies he will bring to the earth, there will be peace. God's name will be one. There will be no longer all these different religions that cannot make peace with each other. Peace will come to the earth as the disagreements that exist today will no longer be there to bring war. Peace will come to the earth because men will understand the things of Almighty God, the righteous ways of God, and that will result in the earth being filled with his glory as the waters cover the sea. If you turn back with me to Isaiah 2 that we, looked, that we read earlier on, Isaiah 2 and verses 2 to 4 to start with. We looked at this very briefly before. We read, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations and rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Because the Lord Jesus Christ make, will make men worship God as he requires, he will make men to see that it, Almighty God, the, the true way in which they should worship Almighty God. And men will see the benefit of this and walk in those ways. And when that does occur, these things will happen. Just think what the people of Syria will think in that day. Every nation on this earth, really. Because they will see one who is righteous. One who is turning men to the true God. One who, because of his policies, will see that there will be no more war. In actual fact, 
They will not learn war. In verse 11 to 12 and verse 17, we read, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come, shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And the loftiness of man shall be brought down, verse 17, bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. You see, everyone that is proud and lofty, everyone that is lifted up, doesn't that refer to the politicians we have today? Proud and lofty, lifted up. Well, they're going to be brought low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. You see, men will have to realise that it is God alone that is to be exalted. The so-called big men of the world will be humbled. They'll be brought down or they will not be there in that day. They'll have to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ and God his Father. The proud and lofty will be brought down. They'll be brought to realise that they are no better than the person beside them and that it is the ways of Almighty God alone that can provide them with a hope for the future. Finally then, if you'll turn with me to Psalm 149 and verses 4 to 9. We can see those who will assist the Lord Jesus Christ in bringing this to pass upon the earth. Psalm 149, verse 4 to 9, we read, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishment upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgments written. This honour hath all the saints. Praise ye the Lord. What this psalm tells us is the work of the saints under the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of the saints, those who will be with the Lord Jesus Christ in that day, who in this their day of opportunity have understood the things of Almighty God and have put their faith and trust in him. You see, the invitation is to every one of us to be part of that purpose of God with the earth and to execute the righteous judgments of God on the earth so that his purpose of filling it with his glory may be fulfilled. These people that are termed here the saints, those who have been faithful to Almighty God in their day of opportunity, will execute judgment on the nations and punish those people who oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. Those rulers who do not submit, we told, will be imprisoned, as will the nobles, the saints or those who are with the Lord Jesus Christ will have the honour of pouring out the judgments written on this earth. We're told this honour hath all the saints. You see, they will execute the judgments of God that God has in store for a wicked world that rejects his ways with the ultimate, the ultimate end of bringing them to see that it is God alone that should be praised so that they may give God the glory, so that this earth may be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. You see, the other option is not to take no part in pouring these judgments on the earth, but have those judgments poured upon us. The opportunity is for you and me to decide which side we want to be on with the Lord Jesus Christ or with the kingdom of this earth, of the, of the world today, the kingdom of men, and feel those judgments. You see, the invitation is to every person. 
In Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Salvation is to those who hear the gospel, the good news of the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and are baptised and continue in that way. Such will be saved and receive salvation. You owe it to yourselves to look into these things, and as such, any Christadelphian will be happy to discuss these matters with you further, so that when the Lord Jesus Christ does return to subdue this earth, you may be among those whose honour it is to execute the judgments written. We thank you for your time.